It's, um, I realize now not to be phased by this. It's a, it's a very AA thing, the, the, continu the continuous entrance into the space <laughs> of the audience. Um, whenever I'm about to give a talk about work, I, uh, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me all right? Only just. Do I need to, am I amplified? I'm wearing technology, so I think I'm amplified. Is that better? Okay. Um, I often think about a little statement by Ed Ruscha, the uh, American artist, who uh, has this wonderful um, imaginary figure called the Information Man. So before talks, when my mind goes a complete blank, I wish for the Information Man. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a little quote of Ed Ruscha's about the Information Man. He says that this, this is, quote, it would be nice if sometime a man would come up to me on the street and say, hello, I'm the information man, and you have not said the word yours for 13 minutes. You have not said the word praise for 18 days, 3 hours and 19 minutes. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully the information, I feel like I should be the information man. But uh, talking about one's own work, What's the viewpoint on it? I felt uh, a certain kind of conversation was possible with uh, those of you that were here last week for Richard Wentworth's talk. I felt a certain conversation was possible with some of the uh, issues that Richard raised about a certain kind of predicament that artists might find themselves in in relation to invitations to make work. And um, I'm going to be talking in part about that this evening. Uh, there'll be a certain kind of watery theme and a certain kind of woodland theme and a certain sort of aerial and acoustic theme. Um, but first of all, about viewpoint. I think it's Umberto Eco, Eco who points out that uh, since Thomas Aquinas there's been this persistent metaphor about uh, a certain sort of cultural high ground. And perhaps it's still a persistent mythology um, that persists amongst um, artists that they occupy a, a certain kind of cultural high ground, uh, a sort of high ground from which a panoramic view of potential work and its location so socially and culturally is possible. Uh, there are alternative models, of course, to that. And I was reminded of one of these recently in Glasgow, where I'm doing some teaching these days, um, in a post office in Socky Hall Street, where um, you can pass the time queuing up to buy stamps by reading the Gary Larson cartoon postcards that are on sale in the, uh, in the greetings card racks. And... Um, one of them reminded me of another metaphor, which, um, which is not that we occupy, or any of us who are practitioners of any sort, any kind of cultural high ground, but that maybe we're all rather more like fish, swimming about in a medium about which we can only know a certain limited amount, which is to do with that amount of space that we're immediately occupying. And I'm not, uh, it's an interesting one, but I've never been quite taken by the, uh, the kind of cold-blooded, clammy sort of uh, myth 
I don't feel too fishy myself, but I was reminded of this recently by this Larson cartoon. I'm very fond of certain Gary Larson cartoons. You probably know this one. It's a, it's a wonderful kind of visual oxymoron. It's, uh, it's the one with the occasional table and the goldfish bowl. You know this one? And the goldfish bowl <laughs> is in flames. It's half full of water and flames are leaping out of the goldfish bowl. And um, <laughs> the water's on fire. And standing on their tails on the occasional table, looking in horror at the flames, are three goldfish. And one of them says, thank God we got out of there alive. <laughs> <laughs> and then adds, as an afterthought, of course, now we're equally screwed. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> that, in addition, is a certain kind of uh, sense of uh, predicament. But at this stage in a talk, I feel much more closely identified with another Larson cartoon, which is the... Um, the bloodhound in the forest cartoon. You know the one in forest scene? Serious guys, big check shirts and hats. Bloodhound straining at the leash, nose to the ground. And a thought that, you know, they're earnestly following the, the bloodhound through the wood. And the dog has a thought bubble coming up from its head and it's thinking, can't smell a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> That's how I feel right now, um, as we begin to neg <laughs> negotiate a way towards some recent work. And uh, if we could maybe have the first slides, I want to go very quickly through, um, very, very quickly through a, a group of pieces that were uh, performance-based works. Not to dwell on them, but just to, to sort of hold in mind the idea of a kind of performative space, if you like, the kind of space that I occupy between you and the wall here, or between you and the screen. And it's a space that I've worked with a number of choreographers and artists for a period of about five years, and I still do occasionally inhabit this space as a performer. I suppose I'm doing that right now. Um, that space is a space that interested me very, very much because it was a space in which the body, the kind of active performing body could be, in, well, engaged really. And uh, these pieces were all collaborative, all choreographic in a certain uh, degree. This is a work with Miranda Tufnell and Dennis Greenwood. Um, this is another work with Miranda Tufnell at Tramway in Glasgow. And this is a piece with Catherine Tucker at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. You might uh, quickly get a sense of the fact that um, this screen or wall, it's a, it's a very definite uh, architectural issue for me, the idea of an active surface, and is probably inextricably li linked to the fact that I trained as a painter. So the performing body over and over again was framed by, um, or took up a set of possible relations, not only to a three-dimensional space um, of performance, but especially to, um, to this two-dimensional, extensive, and, and often very vivid uh, surface. I think that at least was my hope. It was some time before I realized or actually um, understood the fact that certain of these um, methods that I employed to activate those sorts of surfaces um, could exist without the presence of an actual uh, choreographed performing body. And that uh, maybe what I realized at that point that began to open up was the possibility of um, of an engagement for the viewer that was um, that was in a sense performative, um, but that was certainly much more of a participatory kind of engagement than um, 
than simply the visual connection between a viewer and, uh, and an object. And the first works where this space began to open up for me occurred during a residency that I, that I enjoyed very much at King's College in Cambridge with the Cambridge Darkroom Gallery. This work was installed at the Museum of Classical Archaeology in Cambridge and it involved covering up their largest single exhibit which was the uh, cast of the west pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia and um, disturbing that surface with uh, an extremely noisy uh, theatrical wind machine which you can see actually that's this rather inelegant box. The color of the, sli of the slides, by the way, is extremely accurate. These, this is the museum's approach to, uh, I think it's supposed to be terracotta red. <coughs> but a work that, um, that also took place there, <coughs> which involved the illumination of King's College Chapel, is the one which on reflection I think I learned most from because it was much clearer to me, I think, and also to visitors to this piece, that they were entering a very definite institutional space um, when they came to see this piece of work and that it, the negotiation that they had to make with that space was, um, became quite a self-conscious one, but it also became a social one. On the left is a familiar postcard type view of King's College Chapel. This was actually the view from my studio window for exactly a year. And it was during the course of that year that um, I began to understand certain um, issues of uh, uh, proprietorial issues to do with the institution and its relation of the university and its relation to the uh, community of the city and also to the community of um, the constantly shifting community of international tourism, this group of visitors. If you're a member of the college, you can walk across this space. That is, you can walk across the grass. If you're not, then the porters from the lodge will rush out and physically remove you from the lawn. <laughs> While I was a, an artist there, I was uh, given this indulgence, this luxury, and I learned very quickly from observation from my studio window, actually watching uh, the academic staff of the, of the college crossing the lawn. I learned how to do it, and the way that you did it <laughs> <coughs> was to always carry a book, and the book had to be held like this, very high, and the head was always down. And, and then you went <laughs> like that. That was, that's how you did it very, very, it's the only way to do it because it's actually incredibly embarrassing to walk across the grass because <laughs> all the members of the public are looking at you and thinking, who the fuck does he think he is walking across <laughs> the grass? So, um, anyway, uh, and of course as soon as my res residency there ended, I no longer had this right, so um, I immediately was relegated to the pathways again, you have to walk all the way around. So, it, it wasn't an insignificant thing when this illumination occurred that uh, the college agreed to open uh, the front court at night to members of the public, but also to allow them to walk on the grass. So, that in the evening, um, it became quite a social space. It reminded some people, including me, a little bit of, um, of the way Italian piazzas fill up in the evening at dusk, when people just hang out in little clusters, little groups. So people were not coming along and standing, looking at the elevation of the chapel really as an object or a, an image. In fact, the photograph of it is extremely deceptive and deactivating of what was really going on. People were just hanging around in small groups, talking to each other and turning around occasionally and looking at the building. Now this illumination took place from late afternoon when these blue lights made absolutely no visual impression at all on the building, when it was so bright, when daylight was so bright that you couldn't detect any blue at all. And they stayed on right through dusk to a point of total darkness when they were switched off. So 
the whole point of the piece wasn't that it should be a, a spotlit building in a kind of steady state, but that it should be a building whose surface was in a constant state of change against the changing uh, luminosity of the evening sky. And it was therefore in that sort of dusk period that interests me very much, I like that time of day a lot, that um, this became a, a social space of a different sort. Um, just very quickly to get to the work that I want to talk about in a little more, <coughs> a little more uh, detail, two works that, um, that occurred shortly afterwards, but quite separately. One in Cambridge, in a building that is known as um, Old Addenbrooke's Hospital. Those of you that, that know Cambridge will recognize the building. It's almost opposite the Fitzwilliam Museum in the middle of the town. And when Cambridge built its new Addenbrooke's Hospital on a greenfield site on the edge of town, <coughs> because the capacity of this hospital was no longer adequate, um, then began the scandalous sort of abandonment of the building. It sat empty for 17 years in the middle of the city. Um, those of you that know Cambridge well will know too that the building has now been converted into a school of business studies. It's one of those uh, cruel ironies um, of change of use of hospital buildings in this country in the last 15 years. And uh, an exhibition took place organized by the Cambridge Darkroom called Power and Providence which invited a number of artists to work with the institution of the hospital. And I elected to install these blue lights in the main facade of the building um, as night lights, uh, so that every evening for some six weeks from, a, from dusk until dawn, these blue lights uh, shone out from the uh, hospital windows. They came on as night fell, and they stayed on all night until dawn came up when they were switched out. So it was very much a nightlight for the old Addenbrooke's Hospital. And it took place literally in the uh, last one and a half months before work began on the conversion of the building. So it was the end of its, um, of its life as a hospital. Within about a year or so of that taking place, to my uh, surprise, I was invited by Rear Window, who organized some really wonderful site-specific projects um, to consider working in another site. And this, to my amazement, was another abandoned hospital, but this time St. Peter's Hospital in Henrietta Street in Covent Garden. And, um, the relationship of the building to the street and therefore to the viewer, to the public, was completely different. Addenbrooke's is set back behind railings uh, quite a long way from the street. Um, St. Peter's is right on the pavement. And um, while the upper floors of this building were used for a purely daylit exhibition of painting, the ground floor was occupied by lights that were strewn across the floor that again came on at dusk and stayed on until dawn. It was a second night light. And this time, um, this exhibition took place at St. Peter's Hospital in the last month before developers began work converting the building, again with uh, extremely ironic change of use into the upper wards of the building would have been turned into what are described as luxury loft style apartments. And the ground floor rooms that I think had been offices um, have been converted into retail units. So from the street, the it looked as if there was maybe a, an illuminated swimming pool inside the building. But once you crossed um, and peered in through the windows, all that was illuminated was this state of abandonment of the building. You couldn't enter these rooms. You could only look through the windows into the uh, stripped out and abandoned uh, floors of the hospital. 
it was shortly after this <coughs> that uh, I received a fantastic invitation to, to spend a period of six months working as an artist in residence at uh, Harvard. And while I was there, um, I spent a, quite a large amount of time of those few months <coughs> wondering how on earth to respond to the main invitation, which was to, uh, to work towards a publicly cited artwork in the space that's known as Harvard Yard. And those of you uh, that know Harvard will know that Harvard Yard is actually an extremely extensive um, outdoor space that runs between and interconnects between um, some of the principal buildings uh, of the university. We'll come to that shortly. Um, this is where I began to feel some, some sympathy with the, with the condition of anxiety that Richard was t talking about last week uh, in relation to, another, uh, to an invitation of, of his to make a piece of work. And um, while I knew that the organizers of this residency knew about the work that I'd done in relation to buildings and light, there was never any um, kind of demand that I would respond to the invitation in that way. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that one of the, um, one of the predicaments that artists find themselves in amongst numerous invitations these days to work in relation to institutions. Um, the question is, how do, you, how do you do that without being positioned by the invitation? And um, at the time, I was reading about some of the uh, film works of Marguerite Duras. And I came across a description by her of, um, of a particular work of hers in which she's talking about the approach to making the film within a, it's actually with, within an abandoned French chateau. And I ended up making a piece of work in the lobby of the GSD, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, which is here on the left, um, on the project wall of that lobby. The piece came together as, an, as a huge, uh, I think 16 feet long, uh, Xeroxed reproduction of a film still, of a film still <coughs> from a Marguerite Duras film. And projected onto it was a small text written by Duras about the shooting of that actual shot. And um, I'm not sure if we can read it, but I can read it to you if you can't read it from the back. This is what she has to say. <coughs> she says, I remember when we filmed the first stage, there was a piece of cloth that hung awkwardly from the wall. And this is it, this is here. I went over to the image and put the cloth back into a vertical position. And everyone cried out because it was part of the set. I never touched anything after that. If a branch got in the way, we all moved over to film another one. We never touched anything, whatever it was. We truly glided through it, encoiled in time, changed nothing, modified nothing. And so things came to us more easily. We didn't cheat once. Everything you see in the film is still there. And everyone can go there to see it and recapture what we did. It's all there intact. It's an interesting statement because there's obviously, I mean, it's, it's a fantasy, really, that it's all still there intact. But the idea that she was conveying of making a work in a space, in a habitable or once inhabited space, that involved changing nothing, um, I found absolutely riveting and extremely uh, stimulating. And I began to think about this invitation to make a piece of work in Harvard Yard um, as an invitation to maybe not materially uh, bring anything to the place. I was also, this, is, this was one of those fortuities, really. Um, oops. Which was uh, the completely un, 
anticipated relationship between um, the abandoned interior of the, these hospital spaces and uh, and the organisation in the in the uh, movie camera on the cinema screen of these um, chateau interiors. The thing that really inhabits Marguerite Duras's uh, imagery in this film is text. Uh, and it wasn't that, at least not consciously that, that led me to, um, to consider working with sound. But the space that I was faced with, which really daunted me, I have to tell you, was this. And this was um, not my first visit to Harvard, but it was the first fully-fledged working visit. Middle of winter, middle of a New England winter, and this is a space in Harvard Yard, which is the major ceremonial space, really. It's where um, commencement, the graduation ceremony, is held out of doors every year. Um, and this is when I first really took it in, with its network of um, asymmetrical crisscrossing pathways and its 40-odd uh, mature elm trees that are in a, uh, uh, that are dying. They're, they're one of the largest groups of elm trees surviving uh, in this part of North America. They're also dying of Dutch elm disease, as the elms did in Britain. How to um, make a publicly cited artwork in a space like this? On the right is this is a building by Bullfinch. Um, on the left. We're looking down from the steps of the Widener Library across towards Memorial Church. That's looking back on the right towards the Widener Library. And th this uh, greystone building is, is, um, is the heart of the um, administration, really, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the institution. So, the space is bounded by buildings that um, impose upon it enormously, I think. And that was my predicament. How to respond to this space uh, and not be positioned by it. And what I mean by that is that it seemed to me that to try to work with this architecture could mean only one of two things. Uh, either to be positioned in the sense of appearing to somehow celebrate the institution, or to be positioned by somehow seeming to critique it. And I didn't want to be in either of those positions. They didn't interest me as the basis for making work. But nevertheless, how to inhabit the space. And it was really um, some two and a half or three months, perhaps even longer, before I gradually began to think about um, the possibility of introducing sound into this space instead of um, a visual presence. I had all sorts of uh, ideas that struck me as kind of naff at the time. But uh, and one of them, interestingly enough, was uh, the possibility of actually installing uh, the sounds of a completely different um, place in Harvard Yard. I thought about the possibility of introducing rainforest recordings into these, uh, into the treetops of, um, of a New England uh, university space and then abandoned that. But it did give me, a, 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 it generated a kind of desire, that, that uh, speculation at least, um, to possibly travel to, um, to rainforest areas of the world. And as uh, I will explain, um, although I had no idea that this would occur, with it exactly one year to the month that the installation took place at Harvard Yard eventually, I did indeed find myself in the uh, upper Orinoco River, which is part of the Amazon basin in Venezuela, <laughs> making the tape recordings that um, one of which you hear in the reception area here. 
what eventually happened here was, um, was that a set of readings took place and um, it became an extremely collaborative project for me. I was working with a number of undergraduate and graduate students and um, in a conversation with one of them, this idea of, um, of changing the sense of place that this site had um, brought up the subject of Italo Calvino's book, Invisible Cities. And at the time, I felt that that book of Calvino's was a kind of reassuring bit of research material. You know, it was that, oh yeah, Invisible Cities, fantastic, of course. That's, uh, maybe I'm on the right track kind of thought. Maybe if I'm developing something about this, if there's a publication, maybe we could use one or two of the stories as a kind of reference. But gradually, as I um, thought through the possibilities of the work, the Calvino texts became uh, the center of the sound piece. In eventually 10, we got copyright permission to to record 10 of the stories from Invisible Cities and, um, and replay them in these rather unusual circumstances. It took a long time sailing close to the wind to get this permission after going through two um, literary agents in the States who had never had a request like this for copyright <coughs> use. Um, the request was eventually referred back to Calvino's estate, which essentially means that Calvino's widow considered the request. And days went by with no reply to this. We already had to start recording the readings. And day after day after day went by, and I had this complete picture. You know, I kept calling up this literary agent who'd sent on the request in New York almost every day saying, have we heard anything, have we heard? No, no, he said, and they were really keen on this, but no, we haven't heard anything. And I kept saying, well, what's happened? And he said, it's okay, we've sent a fax. And I had this absolute picture, you know, Calvino's widow lives in Rome. And I had this absolute picture of a, of a swimming pool on a terrace, you know, above Rome. I could see it. And, um, and a kind of wrought iron table with a glass top next to the pool. And on the table, I could see the fax and I could just see the gust of wind, you know, lifting the fax off the table <laughs> and wafting it onto the surface of the swimming pool and I could see the fax sinking to the bottom of the swimming pool. <laughs> so I would say, send another fax. It's okay, he'd say, well, it's, it's okay. And eventually it was fine. We got the permission. But at the same time that I began to invite members of the university to make the tape recordings of the Calvino readings, um, I was inviting them also to make recordings of their own stories about place. Uh, this happened with the very first um, reader who was um, a social theorist called Svetlana Boim, she's Russian. And she read Calvino brilliantly in Italian and in English. And then she said, oh, I wish we had Calvino in Russian. I would love to hear Russian in the space. And we didn't have a translation of Calvino in Russian. But as she was just about to leave, she said, what about the founding of St. Petersburg? And for the first time in some 20 years, she's told me, she hadn't thought of this until that moment, she remembered uh, this account of the founding of St. Petersburg that she had learnt as a child at school, uh, in which the whole class would learn the story and everybody would stand up and recite the story, you know, the kind of thing. So that was her first reading, and so accumulated about 30 recordings of individuals reading in about nine or 10 languages, um, texts about place. The edited sound recordings were suspended in the trees. Um, high up in the, there were 30 sound sources, little battery powered speakers, auto reverse cassette players, and each evening at dusk for two weeks, um, 
between seven in the evening and nine o'clock, which was between dusk and darkness, um, these 30 sound sources relayed at quite a subtle sort of volume um, these readings about place. And the photographs that I've got here were taken for me of people in the act of listening uh, to these stories. I had thought, I was thinking about Cambridge, people walking like this through the space, that with any luck, here are the necessary papers for walking through the <laughs> university. I, I thought, with any luck, people will pause and maybe take away a fragment overheard. But to my amazement, and this war, it, it really did surprise me, um, people not only stopped but came back to the space repeatedly over this two-week period and spent entire evenings there listening to these stories. And this was a complicated thing because it was impossible to learn the piece. People who, were, who had made these recordings for me would come up to me, like Svetlana actually did, and say, where's my recording? And I couldn't tell them where their voices were. You know, the tapes were all edited differently with different periods of silence between the texts so that you might arrive. Let me describe the kind of experience acoustically. Walking into the space, it was possible to hear simultaneously <coughs> the at least 30 voices coming from different directions around the space. It was like a kind of subtle hubbub of voices. And as you walk through a space like that, if you imagine 30 sound sources suspended above your head in different parts of an outdoor space like that, as you traverse it and approach one of the sound sources, of course, it gets louder. As you move towards that, eventually finding yourself underneath it. It's extremely clear, quite audible. It was entirely possible that you would arrive at that audible sound source within a second or two of the end of that reading, which might mean that there might be perhaps a minute, five minutes, or only ten seconds of silence before another reading would begin to take place. And um, in that sense, visitors to the work were constantly kept moving around the space. But people were coming and uh, picnicking under the trees, listening to the work. And thanks to the good offices of the Boston Globe, who um, reviewed and previewed the piece at weekends, there were literally hundreds of people in the space. So once again, the audience that I'd expected, which I'd expected <coughs> the audience to really consist of members of the university, it was completely exceeded. I really like these photographs. <laughs> this guy is very tense. He appears in a couple of um, pictures looking extremely uh, proprietorial. All of these photographs are taken while it was still quite light, but um, <coughs> in fact, the the piece was running through to darkness, and the um, university agreed to extinguish the low-level uh, pathway lighting. It's very touching, I thought, the way that uh, people established a kind of physical relation to, to the um, to the trees in, in these acts of listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is one of my favorite pictures, actually, on the left. But I like this kind of Jack Nicholson look-alike guy. And he, here's the very uptight guy in the background. <laughs> uh, 
as it got darker, um, <coughs> it was possible eventually to see that the very, very tops of the trees were lit, were illuminated by white light. It was simply a, a glancing kind of beam over the tops of the trees so that an extremely dark space Im began to uh, occur on the ground, which was the acoustic space, the space of listening. Uh, underneath this uh, luminous uh, level of the young green uh, leaves, this occurred in May. And uh, that attraction to the eye um, up into the treetops was, um, was extended on one evening during the, during the duration of the work when um, I managed to uh, arrange my first um, aeroplane piece, which was uh, the result of being out of doors one, ev one morning, actually, outside the studio that I occupied there. Uh, hearing the sound of a, of a single-engined aeroplane flying over, and it was towing a banner, and the banner said, your message here, phone this number. So I phoned the number and found myself talking to, to a pilot called Murray from Aero Ads, and I said, would you like to make a, you know, fly a piece of work for me? And he said, yeah. <laughs> It'll make a change from flying over Fenway Park, which is Boston's baseball ground, at night, towing things saying, Mary, marry me, which is apparently what he has to do quite a lot of his time. So we, we made a, worked, I worked with um, two people, in, a classicist and a historian, on um, trying to uh, adapt Sappho's first fragment, which um, is a beautiful text, to uh, a kind of translation that would fly well. Murray said, 40 letters or spaces, he said. Any longer than that, and it doesn't fly so well. So, um, words of air open to the ear became the piece, and Murray flew in one evening and did six circuits of Harvard Yard before sort of tipping his wings and flying back to his Massachusetts uh, airstrip. So, on the right, you can see the top of the spire of Memorial Church. What's the time? Oh, God. So, you can understand how exactly a year later, I, um, I had no idea at that point that within a year I was going to receive a most extraordinary invitation to um, undertake a five-week journey on the Orinoco River. And I thought a lot about this this afternoon. I talked to Andrew earlier on about how to do this in the talk. I took hundreds of photographs on a five-week journey in the upper Orinoco, which is in the, in the far south, very close to the Brazilian border of Venezuela, in the middle of the um, Amazon Basin rainforest. And uh, in the end, I've only, dis I've only included three slides from that journey, rather than hundreds. I made about two hours of Super 8 film, and I recorded four and a half hours of sound, and I took about 300 pictures, I think. But I remembered um, the remarks of uh, Richard Deacon. I have to thank Richard Deacon for this most extraordinary invitation, because the organizers of a Venezuelan Arts Foundation knew that Richard had traveled himself up this river, and they contacted him to uh, ask him to suggest artists who he thought might be interested in this trip. So I'm forever indebted to Richard for making that suggestion. But I'm also indebted to him for, for doing two things. Before I left, um, he said something really interesting to me. He said, yes, he said, I'll talk to you about it, but I'm not going to show you any photographs of it. And it was a, it was a fantastic... Um, decision on his part not to show me any photographs <laughs> that he'd taken there. And in the talking about it, he said something else that I thought was extremely perceptive. He said, the trouble with this kind of experience is that it's so easy to, um, 
to dissolve it into anecdote. And, um, and that's true. It's actually quite difficult to talk about um, without that happening. But these are two photographs to move from Murray's Arrow Ads plane flying over Harvard Yard in New England to two photographs taken from the light, the small aeroplane that flew us into um, a small village called Las Marelda, which, as it happens, is the title of one of the cities in Calvino's book, Invisible Cities. Las Meralda is a, is a tiny Chakwana Indian village on the banks of the Orinoco, which until a year before we went had had a piece of rough grass savanna land as an airstrip. When we arrived, um, a full length military airstrip had been laid down. And so flying down out of this sky was quite a shock. And within a week of, um, af of our arrival in Las Merelda, we witnessed the, uh, the first test landing of a Venezuelan military Hercules transport plane on the new airstrip. It was an extremely uh, sobering moment. And I think I've got one photograph of our arrival, which is, yeah. What I've, I found something very interesting about this. There, this was the first of a series of, um, of journeys for four years. Um, the organizers are inviting a different group of artists to travel on the Orinoco. Uh, this was the first year. Uh, there were four Venezuelan artists, um, Jean-Luc Vilmuth, a French artist, and me, and a crew. And uh, when we landed, the, um, the filing cabinet came with it, flew with us into the forest. The town that we landed at was a kind of organizing base for um, all sorts of research activities and development projects that are going on in the middle of the Amazon basin on the Venezuelan side. And um, very complicated it is indeed. In the two weeks that we'd spent in Caracas and traveling to the point where we were flown into the uh, forest, it had been extremely difficult to get any sense of the politics of the indigenous people of this part of the country. But as soon as we landed in the middle of the forest, it was impossible to avoid for five weeks um, the intensely problematic politics um, of the two largest indigenous groups of people who live in the areas that we were traveling in, who were the Chequana and the Yanomami people. And that politics, I think, is, is sort of encapsulated all at once in the photograph on the left with the tarmac airstrip, the arrival of the filing cabinet, the presence here of the, this is one of the Catholic nuns who run the mission in La Esmeralda who was an amazing sight, actually, zooming down the airstrip on her moped whenever a plane landed. <laughs> and um, in the background, can you see, you see the guy bending over? Those of you that can see, oh, I've got a pointer. Um, if I knew how to work this. Uh, I don't know how to work it. Well. Just behind this guy who's bending over there is a little green blob. And what that green blob is, is a part of a construction crane. And that, I mean a construction crane like the ones that build high-rise buildings. And that construction crane was lying in pieces all around this tiny village. It was one of the most bizarre um, projects that you could imagine occurring, an Austrian botanist had the idea that you could investigate the canopy of the rainforest if you built a construction crane in the middle of it. And botanists could winch themselves down from the end of the arm of the construction crane into the treetops without doing any damage. <laughs> what a cool idea. 
and 100 hours of Venezuelan military helicopter time had been given to flying the crane into position and building it up from the ground, you know, hovering. You, would, you all know what would happen if you, if you hover in a helicopter over the top of a forest. You knock it down. And um, for days, we saw a helicopter flying off with these huge components. And they destroyed acres um, with bits of crane banging about in the trees and the downdraft from the helicopter and eventually abandoned the whole project. And um, the, the, the crane, which was tastefully painted green, lay um, in the savannah awaiting its next destination. I think I'm going to have to wrap this up in a minute because it's 8 o'clock almost. What I wanted to move towards was um, <coughs> was, I suppose, the demands that I felt on me to make a piece of work as a result of that experience. Um, we spent f five weeks in boats and hammocks about 12 people altogether, including the crew and the curator who was present at all times. <laughs> the, the 12 of us were as close together for five weeks as you all are really sitting in the audience. You, you can't go for a walk in the forest like that. It's not that kind of place. It's a difficult, extremely difficult place when you're on the only way that you can move through it is on the river. There's no such thing as a track or a path. And um, at the beginning of the rainy season, it's an extremely difficult place to be. Um, I think I can sum it up in a short description. Um, one evening, we had been making our way for about a four-day um, sort of side journey up a tributary, tributary river called the Aguapo River, which is a very, very dark river. The Orinoco is full of silt. It's a kind of yellow river. But the tributaries that come down from the high highlands are uh, mineral rich. And the water is very clear, but it's, it's like coffee. It's black coffee it's like, or Coca-Cola. It's that kind of incredibly sparkling, extremely dark liquid. And um, one evening. We had been swimming in the rivers, which we did every day to wash and, and uh, keep cool. We'd been washing clothes with environmentally friendly soap, which you can take into these protected areas. This is a, it's called a, a, an international biosphere park. It's extremely difficult to get permission to go to these places. The curators had worked for over a year to get permissions for a group of artists to travel there. It's not part of the world that tourism reaches. And this soap is very attractive to butterflies. So as the evening sun was setting and the pink clouds were beginning to accumulate over the treetops, and butterflies are sitting all over the soap suds, hundreds of them. And as it got darker, lightning flashes began to appear in the evening sky. And as it got dark enough, um, these are not fireflies, but a swar but swarming wasps. Um, but as it got darker, fireflies appeared on the, on the opposite bank. We had fantastically delicious river fish to eat. I was writing all of this down in a letter and um, recording this absolutely sublime kind of accumulation of things that was going on. And then it began to rain. And it rained for 12 hours all night. Nobody slept. The hammocks were inundated with water. Ground turns to mud. The whole place begins to stink. And as soon as daylight comes up, even in the pouring rain, the insects come up. And it's, it's like that. It moves from sub sublime moments to total squalor and completely abject um, misery. It's a really <laughs> very 
hard place, and throughout the five weeks, we relied all the time on the hospitality and goodwill of the Chekwana or Yanomami people whose villages we stayed in. How on earth do you come back from such complex circumstances and respond to an invitation to make a piece of work to be exhibited in a group show, of including the other artists who took part in the trip? It's thankfully, the exhibition has been delayed for nearly two years because of local government changes, which, which mean a lot in Venezuela. And it's taken me two years to begin, really, to even start to work with the, um, with the material that I brought back from me. You know, the big crisis was, how on earth do you manage to do, to do this without um, um, making some kind of um, anthropological response to the experience, to the place, to the people. It's absolutely not what I wanted to do. In the end, what I, I've made is a mirror piece that involves 30 sections of mirror, and I've written the entire Anne Olivia Pluribel episode from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake out in engraving on these mirrors. It's the, it's the river episode. It's a river narrative. It includes the names. The Anne Olivia Pluribel episode in Finnegan's Wake includes the names of literally dozens and dozens of world rivers. It's the most extraordinary text. And uh, right in the middle of it is Orinoco. So that seemed to me to be the first step to working with that experience. And um, maybe at this point, we could play this little piece of sound I've got. I hope you can hear this well enough. It's a sound recording of James Joyce reading. And here with the water valve the chittering waters of flittering bats, field mice, bark, talk. Ho, oh, are you not gone a home? What Tom Malone can't hear the bark of bats all the lifting waters of? Ho, oh, talk, save us. My goose won't moose. I feel as old as yonder elm. A tale told of Sean or Shem, all Livia's daughter son. Dark hawks hear us. My whole head falls. I feel as heavy as yonder stone. Tell me of Sean or Shem. Who well Shem and Sean, the living sons and daughters of? Night now. Tell me, tell me, tell me, Elm. Night, night, tell me tale of stem of stone beside the rivering waters of, hither and thithering waters of, night. Wonderful voice, eh? The hither and thithering waters of night. The, um, I want to mention something as a complete change of gear at the end of this. I'd um, had a hope towards the end of the afternoon that uh, we might be able to watch a very short piece of video from an extremely new piece of work that I've made. But unfortunately, we, we can't because the equipment isn't, isn't functioning. Um, and also, it was a very last minute thought of mine to actually, uh, to actually project this imagery. But, um, it's not entirely un unconnected to the, to the rivery, watery theme. And I feel also slightly duty bound to, to, to mention in passing this uh, extremely recent piece of work um, because it's about skating. And when Val in the slide library discovered that I'd been making a piece about skating, um, she was very interested because Val skates. I don't know if you all knew this, but she's a skater. And I share with her an absolute kind of passion about skating. I mean, I've only skated once on a, on a pond outdoors in New England, actually, and fell over a lot, of course, but enjoyed it very much. I'm sure I could do it if I had, you know, ice more often, but... Um, 
I recently made a piece of work in Sunderland. And uh, this invitation was a marvelous kind of moment because uh, I visited Sunderland and discovered two things about the place. One is that um, glass making remains one of it, well, it is actually one of its few now surviving manufacturing industries. Glasses, I had no idea. I thought about shipbuilding on the on the uh, on the Tyne, on Tyne side, but I had no idea that glass manufacturing was such an important thing there. They make incredible um, glassware, glass, industrial glass, you know, extraordinary stuff. And um, glass is a material that I work with a great deal, so I was very excited by that. And the other thing that, that I discovered was that right in the middle of what is actually rather a small town is an enormous leisure center with a full-sized rink, ice rink. And um, I have a long-standing fascination with, with skating. I'll just, I just want to show you this really quickly, and then we'll wrap up really fast. OK. One of my desert island paintings, you know. Which 10 paintings would you take with you? This would be one of them. It's Henry Rayburn's wonderful portrait of uh, the Reverend Robert Walker skating on Duddington Lock. And uh, I've done some work with images of this painting, but I've known the image for years and years and years, about 20 years, which is where this skating thing began. And um, I've long wanted to make a piece of work with a skater. So I'll take this opportunity to um, to announce an advertisement for this year's Video Positive Festival of Film and Video Work in Liverpool and Manchester, which begins in April, which is where um, a film piece that I made with a competition skater based in Sunderland um, is going to be shown. And when you talk about how shifting contexts can be completely sort of dazzling, the, um, the context, the sight, the site for the skater piece in Video Positive in Liverpool is Liverpool's premier club, which you know, called Cream. It's an amazing place. People travel, travel from all over the country to go clubbing at Cream. And um, I'll just end on the installation from Sunderland. I can't show you the state of the piece at. Um, this was the piece at Sunderland. It involved uh, an early to mid 19th century English crystal chandelier, which was about five feet high, hanging just above the ground. Seven, um, two, just over two meters diameter glass discs that were sitting on small velvet cushions. And just up here, to help you interpret that rectangle in the top right-hand corner of the picture is a three-meter square curtain, which is made of an incredible dress fabric called silver liquid lame, and a continuous laser disc projection of an ice skater pirouetting appears and disappears constantly on that uh, silver screen. I was going to... Um, end by reading you some Wordsworth, but maybe you've had enough. And I should um, offer you the opportunity of asking me some questions. So maybe we could, yeah, thank you. What, um, what, what Val, you all know, a lot of you would know who Val is, she's the slide librarian here. What she asked me to tell you all is, is, is this, that skating 
is one of the most remarkable virtuoso performance activities going, that it's a gymnastic, demanding, and totally performative art form. And I absolutely agree with her. I think it's one of the most phenomenal performative activities going. Yeah. Torville and Dean bring tears to my eyes. They move me. <laughs> it's true. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, well, that's the last in this series. Uh, we're recommencing uh, in April with a conference on the work of Dan Graham connected with the exhibition will be happening in April, uh, which I hope you can make. I think it's the 25th of April. But until then, uh, that's the end of the, the artist's lectures. And I'd like to thank David Ward for a marvelous lecture this evening. Thank you. Oh good, how do you do that? <laughs>